engaging God's Word, which is what we've been doing, and going through Hebrews verse by verse. We're in Hebrews chapter 4, so if you have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you or the seat in front of you. We'll be in chapter 4, 11 through 13, looking at the importance of God's Word. And of course, we're a community Bible church. Uh, we want to be a community centered on the Word of God, proclaiming the gospel, which sets us apart as a local church. As we do that, I think it'd be good to go back and uh, read the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's a good reminder of our purpose. I like the concept of a catechism. It means it's from a Greek word, katecheo, and it means to echo back. And the idea was in teaching young people, you wanted them to be able to echo back the truth of Scripture. If you can't echo it back, you probably don't know it. And so as they would ask these questions and they respond, the hope was that in learning those things, they would plant deep into their heart. And this is a good reminder of, I think, the combination of rest and the Word of God, because I think enjoying God is a picture of rest, and that rest is found in the Word of God, which I think you're going to see in Hebrews. I'm going to read the question, and I'm going to have you respond back, do a little catechism class here. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen. (laughs) I love that. To glorify God, not just glorify Him, but enjoy Him. That's what we were created for. Well, how do we find that enjoyment? How do we find that rest? Well, the second question says, what rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? The Word of God, which is contained in the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. How do we enjoy God? We're going to enjoy Him as we understand and allow the Word of God to shape us so that we become more and more like His Son. That's my goal as we go through Hebrews. Uh, We go through it verse by verse, and the emphasis in Hebrews is going to be two things. The identity of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who is He? He He's the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of His nature. How do we respond in light of His identity? This is the exhortation. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. How do we do that? Keeping our eyes on Jesus. That is the dual theme that you're going to see throughout the book of Hebrews. We've looked at the first four chapters. We're getting towards the end of chapter four. Chapters one and two, Jesus is better than the angels. Many people look towards the angels as mediators, and he's saying, no, Jesus Christ is the only mediator because he is the son of God, and he is the son of man, and he has purged us, uh, purged our sins, and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is the mediator between God and man, and the one who fulfills that role of man way back in Genesis 1 and 2. Hebrews 3 and 4, Jesus is better than Moses. These are Jewish believers tempted to go back into Judaism. He is pointing them, no, that's going backwards. Moses is actually a giant arrow pointing towards Christ. You can't go backwards. You need to keep going forwards because in Christ is where you'll find rest. I do think there's some typology. Uh, Moses did not bring them into the promised land. He did not bring them into rest. Who brought them into rest? Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus. And so Jesus is better than Moses. He's the one that leads us into rest. As we look at chapters 3 and 4, I want to, since my passage is not as long today, I wanted to make sure we understand the context and bring us back into the flow of the argument. There are three key words in Hebrews 3 and 4. I don't know if you can see those or not, but they are kata noeo, kateko, and kata pausis, all beginning with that prefix kata. Uh, we're used to that prefix kata. You have uh, catastrophe or catalog or catalyst. That's that same Greek word. It's an intensive word. And so in the Greek language, I think these words would stick out to you because they begin with that same prefix and it would catch your mind. And I think they're the key words in three through four. Now, I know when I bring up Greek, some people get intimidated by Greek. Don't worry, I'm intimidated by Greek. I took it in Bible college and still have nightmares about that. But anyway, I had to buy a bunch of books and a bunch of resources back in Bible college. Today, a lot of that stuff's available online. I challenge you, if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, there's a great website, blueletterbible.org. This is what I call lanyap, a little extra I'm giving you this morning. Blueletterbible.org will take you, it'll show you the English. I don't know if you can see this, but it'll show you the English, then show you the Greek, and then down here, it'll take each English word and point out the Greek word. And that word consider, down here at the bottom, is the Greek word kataneo. If you click on it, then you'll bring up that word, kata no e-o. You'll even see how you can pronounce it. It'll explain uh, what the meanings are. Over here to, to my left, it'll tell you where it's used in different books of the Bible, so you can click on that and see how that word is used. 
But kata noeo, kata is an intensive, noeo is how to think. It's an intensive thinking. It's a fixing your eyes, fixing your attention on Jesus Christ. The word is used twice in Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 1, the main imperative of this section, and chapter 10, when it tells us, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So those are really the two things we're to fix our minds on, on our Savior Jesus Christ and on encouraging one another in the body of Christ. Those are the two things Hebrews is going to put emphasis on. Focus on Christ, focus on exhorting one another and encouraging one another as we run this race with Christ. So going back to those three words, kata no eo is an intensive thinking, is fixing your mind on Christ. Related to metanoia, if you're familiar with that Greek term, which means repentance. I'm heading in the wrong direction. I'm running away from God. I'm following my own way as a sheep, going on my own way. Metanoia, as I turn, repentance, faith, as I turn towards God, a change of mind. That's what metanoia means, a change of mind. Now as I'm walking this Christian life, katanoeo, I am to focus and have my intent on Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18, I'm to behold him. Let him saturate my mind, renew my mind, so that I'll be changed from glory unto glory into the image of his Son, which is what God has predestined me to be in the image of his Son. As I'm doing that, I have to kateko, hold intently, hold tightly, hold fast to Christ. It was used as a nautical term. It's almost like we're on a ship and we're trying to hold course as we are heading towards this destination of Christ. And there's winds, and there's waves, and there's other ships going in the opposite direction. And we get constantly pushed off course. But kateko means I'm holding fast, I'm bringing it back on that Godward trajectory. He's not talking about perfection. We'll never reach perfection in the Christian life. He is talking about direction. I'm to constantly have that God mindset that brings me back towards that pursuit of Christ. As I pursue Christ, then kata pausis. Anybody want to guess what English word we get from pausis? Pause. It's exactly what it means. It's an intensive pausing. It's pausing. It's finding rest. It's finding contentment in Christ. This sounds like a battle. Well, it is a battle, but when I recognize I do this through the power, not in my own strength, I can't do it in my own strength, through the power of the Spirit of God, Spirit of God, fill me and strengthen me in my inner man. Help me as I find, as I hold fast to find rest in you. Because in the middle of the storm, you know where the biggest storm usually is? Right here, in my own inner man, in my inner person. And God may not take me out of the storm, but I pray in the midst of it, he calms this storm inside of me, and I find rest in Christ. Those three words are are used, and I think are key words in chapters 3 through 4. As I think about those three words, I think about um, March Madness. (laughs) Any of y'all familiar with March Madness? You know what's going on. Uh, It's probably... I like March Madness. It's a lot of fun. It can be too, too big in your mind, but it is a lot of fun. This is a picture of a man shooting a free throw. And I'm always amazed at those clutch moments, and it usually happens in almost every game. They go to the line. And this was a Wisconsin person at, a, at an Indiana stadium. Do you notice any distractions there? <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. How in the world does a person make a free throw in that kind of environment and situation. What do they have to do? Number one, they have to focus. Focus on what? Yeah, not all those signs. And isn't it interesting? They make it a glass backboard. I mean, to make it even harder, he's got so many uh, pictures out there. He's got noise. He's got distractions. He's got people who are doing everything they can. And in the midst of that, he has to kata no eo. He has to focus intently on the rim. What else does he have to do? Huh? That's it? Just focus on it? Do what he's practiced. Uh, Good free throw shooters, I'm not one, but I've I've heard this is the case. They have a routine. They know what that routine is. They hold fast to that routine. They hold fast to that discipline. And I've, I've heard one of them interviewed. He says, I dribble twice, I spin it twice and I shoot. And no matter what the environment is, no matter what the context is, I do the exact same routine. I hold fast to that routine that I have been taught so that I can perform in the same way. And what's another thing he has to do? Relax. In the midst of that pressure, he has to somehow 
find rest within himself and calm his emotions and almost tune out everything else that the world is doing at that moment and be focused on Christ, holding fast to what he's learned and just finding rest and what, what is happening. Well, I'm, I'm mixing my metaphors here. Find rest in basketball or find rest inside his soul. In our lives, we have to find rest in Christ. And to me, that's a picture. Does he make it all the time? No. But he knows that if he continues to do what he's called to do and he practices it, that eventually he'll gain more and more skill in living and finding rest in the Christian walk. All that to say, as you go back to these three key words, as you look at my uh, flow, I think kind of know, oh, I'd call the exhortation of faith. It's the main one in chapter 3, verse 1. Remember, we started where a long time ago where he said, uh, he appeals to his holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, fix your mind on the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. And he begins to tell them that Christ is better than Moses uh, because he's the builder of the house and the son over the house. And then he says, how are you going to how are you going to keep focusing on Christ? Well, you have to hold fast. Kateko, verse 6, uh, we are to hold fast to the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. I call it the evidence of faith. We are going to get blown off course but I think as the Holy Spirit abiding in us is going to constantly be bringing us back and giving us that Godward focus and that Godward trajectory as we hold fast to Christ. How do we hold fast? Well, in verse 7 of chapter 3, he's going to tell us about the Word of God. And it's the Word of God, believing the Word of God, that enables us to hold fast. When we don't believe it, we encounter God's discipline. Or if we don't know Christ, His wrath, if we do trust it and follow Him, we begin to experience His rest. Well, what is God's rest? Well, chapter 4, 1 through 10. God's rest is available to us today. It's been available since creation, and it is joyful dependency on him, coming to rest in who he is, uh, coming to rest in his sovereignty. Uh, then it's a chiastic structure. I don't mean to scare you, but the idea is what's talked at the beginning is what's at the end, and there's a stair-step progression with a focus right there in the middle. God's rest is that middle point. As we get to verse 11 of chapter 4, now he's going to say, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. How are we going to do that? It's going to be the word of God, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Uh, next week, we're going to look at verse 14, Pastor Josh is, but let's keep reading. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Three key let us exhortations in verse 11, let us be diligent to enter the rest, Verse 14, let us hold fast our confession. Verse 16, let us come boldly to his throne. Um, let's find that rest, which I, sorry, is the experience of faith. Let's pursue that rest. How do we do that? By holding fast to our confession through the word of God. And then how do we do that? Constantly keeping our focus on Jesus Christ and coming before his throne and allowing him to empower us to live this life because he gives us grace in time of need. Did you catch all that? <laughs> Just want to give you the overflow because Hebrews can be hard to understand. I think that's the argument here. The big question that people have is what is God's rest? If you read a bunch of different commentaries or hear different Bible teachers, this is where it's going to be um, shaky to figure out exactly what God's rest is. Some people make exact equivalence, God's rest equals salvation. Once you do that, once you limit God's rest to just salvation, then you have some exegetical challenges because it sure seems like these people are missing out on his rest. So either these are believers who are losing their salvation, which I don't think is possible, or these are people who think they're believers, they're professors, but they're missing out because they're not truly possessors of the Christian life. Unfortunately, Moses is also one who missed out on God's rest. And I have a hard time thinking that it's just equated to salvation because Moses, Aaron, and Miriam all missed out on God's rest. I also have a hard time when you get to verse 11. He says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Let's be diligent to enter that salvation, which would not make sense to me in this context, which I think is primarily written to believers. So what do I think God's rest is? I think it is. It doesn't fit in the blank really well. 
but it's fullness of relationship with God. God's rest is coming to the fullness of relationship with Him. It's, it's salvation, yes, and it's the experience of rest within that salvation and ultimately at glorification when we experience that rest with God. On the back of your page is where I give you my long definition of God's rest. Let me just say that it's going back to Genesis and how we were created and how we were designed. I was created, you were created to have relationship with God and relationship with one another and to be stewards and kings and queens over this earth. That is rest. That is blessing. That is righteousness. That is joy. That is the kingdom. That is contentment. Unfortunately, uh, sin has messed up that whole scenario cut me off from God, cut me off from one another, and has brought a bondage to futility in our world. So how do we find rest? Well, it begins, yes, with salvation in Jesus Christ. When I come to recognize that salvation it has nothing to do with my works, it's not a matter of me doing, 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 doing. It's a matter of what has already been done. It is finished. You want to talk about rest to know that It's not about me, and it's not about what I have to do and what I can do. It's about what he has done, and it's given to me as a gift. And all I have to do is embrace and receive that gift to have eternal life. That is salvation rest. Because either you're going to have pride and think you're self-righteous enough to meet meet God's standard, or you're going to have fear your entire life wondering if you've done enough. And God says, you can't do enough. But my son said, it is finished, it's done. He sat down and now he offers you salvation rest to those who would respond by faith and embrace Christ as their savior. That is salvation rest given as a gift of God. Sanctification rest or submission rest, I think comes as we begin to take Christ's yoke upon us and learn from him for he's gentle and lowly in heart and we will find rest for our souls. I think as we learn to submit to Christ, Uh, we begin to experience that rest more and more. I think that rest is described when you say, the Lord is my salvation, he's my strength, and he's my song. (laughs) I think that's that rest that you can experience in the Christian life as more and more you just declare, thank you, God, for my salvation. Be my strength today and help me to have your joy through your spirit. I think that rest increases when we say it together and you're part of a community that is declaring the Lord is our salvation, our strength, and our song And, of course, we look forward to that one day when Christ reigns on this earth and we, his bride, reign with him and the bondage of the curse is removed and then we experience the rest of God as we, he is our God, we are his people, and he tabernacles among us. I love this verse in Isaiah where it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I'll trust and not be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. That's God's rest. It's a little bit bigger than just salvation. It includes salvation, includes sanctification, includes glorification, and all of that process. I think the Hebrew writer is encouraging us to pursue the rest that is found in Christ. Are you still with me? <laughs> okay, let's look at verse 11. Let us therefore, here's the therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. So first thing he's going to tell us corporately, fervently pursue the fullness of relationship with God. Spudazo is the Greek word, be diligent. Uh, Intensity of purpose leading to intensity of effort. Why settle for a mediocre Christian life? Pursue with intensity fullness that can be found in Christ and in God alone. I love the prayer at the end of Ephesians 3 where Paul says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who of all everything in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, that you'd be strengthened in the inner man through his spirit, strengthened in the inner man, and that Christ would be at home and dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints the width and the length and the depth and the height of the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge. And you know what the ultimate request is in all of that? That you, plural, might be filled with all the fullness of God. Are you pursuing the fullness of God? How awesome. 
to experience the joy of resting in him and salvation and resting in him knowing that he is sovereign and I don't have to take on the responsibilities and the storms of this life. I may go through them, but as I learn to submit to him more and more, he can give me rest for my souls. My soul, how awesome it is to experience the rest of God. Why don't we pursue it? Because we're convinced something's a little bit better than that. I think of my marriage, and uh, we've been married for 25-plus years. Um, and I remember one time telling Liz, I said, Liz, marriage is a gift. Why don't we pursue to enjoy marriage as much as humanly possible? Why don't we just pursue it? It's going to be a challenge because uh, our wills are going to get in the way. We're going to face troubles. But if marriage is a gift, let's pursue it. Let's pursue what it truly means to be intimate and to enjoy each other and to be one. Because I believe there's a fullness there. And I can tell you, there's a contentment and joy after 25 years of marriage I could have never imagined when I first got married. I thought that's where all the joy and excitement would be. I could not fathom the contentment and joy that happens through 25 years of faithful marriage, growing marriage. You know the only way you can experience that? By walking 25 years in faithful marriage. You know how you experience the fullness of God? By trusting that contentment and joy and walking with him in faithfulness day after day and asking him to fill you with the fullness of himself through his spirit. Pursue it. Why don't we pursue it? Because deep down we're convinced something might be a little bit better. That's why this whole book is constantly reminding you Jesus is better. You put whatever you want in that blank. It is not going to satisfy. It may have temporary satisfaction, but it's going to betray you in the end. But unfortunately, your heart, my heart, is constantly, Calvin calls it an idol factory, and I'm constantly putting things over Jesus Christ. What are some of those things? Well, it could be finances, could be science, could be patriotism, could be sports, could be physical fitness, could be my phone I can't get rid of, it may be pleasure, ultimately it's just me. <laughs> I'm convinced that to be happy, I have to meet me. I have to put me first, and I have to do what's right totally for me. And in doing that, I actually lose myself because I find myself as I'm in submission and relationship to God. Most of those things are not bad. I'm not saying that all those things are bad. Uh, most of the things that become idols to our, us are not bad. We just elevate them, and they become more important to us than Christ, and we begin to think that those are the places I can find rest and contentment and not in Christ. Just a few points I think you can make. As he says, let us be diligent to enter that rest. I would say this, what I pursue is a reflection of what I worship. There is something that is occupying my kata no e'o, something that's occupying my mind, that's become the focus of my mind. Whatever that thing is, at that moment, I have become, it has become an idol. It's something that I am beginning to worship because what I'm pursuing is a reflection of what I worship. What I, at that moment, am saying is better than Jesus. I would say the second thing you can learn when he says, let us, is that what I pursue is shaped by my community. Uh, by, by being part of the local church, a local church that hopefully is focused on Jesus Christ and on his word, being part of that community can shape my own pursuit of Christ. Uh, your spiritual health impacts me. My spiritual health impacts you. We are part of the body of Christ. I know we live in an individualistic society, but we are corporately impacting one another as God's household, as his body. And your prayer every day should be for the health of this body of believers because it's going to impact your health. If you come from a dysfunctional family, all of us do to some extent, but one that is extremely dysfunctional, you can get through that and through God's grace you can make it, but that family is going to shape you to some extent. Pray that we don't become a dysfunctional church <laughs> that's putting the emphasis on the wrong things. Pray that we'll be a healthy church that puts an emphasis on Jesus Christ and on learning, submitting to his word because the health of this body is going to impact the health of every person that's a part of this body. Pray for this church because it will impact your spiritual life. 
Third thing I would say is what I pursue, when I pursue the wrong thing, I'll eventually fall. He says, let us be diligent to enter that rest, that fullness of relationship with God, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. Uh, they fell in the wilderness, and we can easily fall. Whatever I put as an idol in my life eventually will betray me. And the thing I think is going to bring me rest will eventually cause a downfall in my own spiritual walk. So fervently pursue. That's the first thing he says. But how do we know? How do we know we're fervently pursuing? How do we know uh, what is shaping our heart? Well, that's why he's going to give the explanation. He's going to say, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So to fervently pursue, I have to humbly present my heart to the examination of God's word because it's going to be the thing that identifies if you're not experiencing rest in the Christian life, if that is not your experience, you need to allow the Word of God to expose your heart and begin to point out those things that may you have put in uh, as a distraction or as elevated above Christ. Uh, I think it is interesting that when you feel stress, where do you feel it? In your shoulders. It's almost like you're carrying something on your shoulders that is causing you that stress and anxiety. And what Christ is saying is, why are you carrying it? What, what about this that you cannot trust me and hand it to me and allow me, cast your cares upon me, knowing that I care for you? Do you struggle with rest? Yes. Do I struggle with rest? Yes. That's why it's a daily walk of learning to experience the fullness of Christ and allowing his word to shape me and renew me from the inside out. Why do we have to let the Word of God be the one that uh, examines our heart? Because our hearts are deceptive. <laughs> you can't trust your own heart. Doesn't that scare you? That your heart will deceive you? In fact, Jeremiah says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Here's the answer. I, the Lord, search the heart. Through my word I test the mind, even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Every once in a while, I like picking up books that seem sort of interesting, and this one was recommended. It's not a Christian book, but it does have some good Christian themes. It's uh, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. <laughs> <laughs> and the subtitle is Why We Justify Foolish Beliefs, Bad Decisions, and Hurtful Acts. Um, here's one of the things they say. Dissonance theory, that's the fancy name, is a theory of blind spots of how and why people unintentionally blind themselves so that they fail to notice vital events and information that might make them question their behavior or their convictions. Our brains come packaged with self-serving habits that allow us to justify our own perceptions and beliefs as being accurate, realistic, and unbiased. Social psychologists call this naive realism, the inescapable conviction that we perceive objects and events clearly as they really are. We assume that other reasonable people see things the same way we do. If they disagree with us, they obviously aren't seeing clearly. And they did this little experiment. I thought this experiment was interesting. They did an experiment. Social psychologists, they, they did an experiment. His name was Jeffrey Cohen. He found that Democrats will endorse an extremely restrictive welfare pro proposal, one usually associated with Republicans, if they think it had been proposed by Democrats. And Republicans will support a generous welfare policy, if they think it comes from the Republicans. When they were told about this, none of the people were aware of their blind spots, uh, that they were being influenced by their party's position. Instead, they all claimed that they, their beliefs followed logically from their own careful study of the policy at hand, guided by their general philosophy of government. Did you catch all that? They'd already had their biases and their presuppositions. If this is from my party, it must be good. I must like it. Or if it's not for my party, I must hate it. And even when they were confronted, they still justified themselves and said, no, I looked at the policy and read it. I guess I just, I guess it's a good one. Um, they also talk about marriage and, and how that relationship is often, a, um, that self-justification is the main thing that harms a marriage. They say, we think self-justification is the prime suspect in the murder of marriage. Each partner resolves the dissonance caused by conflicts and irritations by explaining the spouse's behavior in a particular way. That explanation in turn sets them down a path. Those who travel this path of shame and blame will eventually begin to rewrite the story of their own marriage. As they do, they seek further evidence to justify their growing pessimism or contempt, 
contemptuous views of others or of each other. They shift from minimizing negative aspects of the marriage to overemphasizing them, seeking every bit of supporting evidence to fit their new story. It should scare us that we can self-justify and convince ourselves of just about anything. And if you're not convinced your heart can be deceptive, you'll never understand how deceptive it is. But it's understanding its deceptiveness that points us to the Word of God, because what does He do? He says, we can't understand our own heart, but the Word of God is living. Uh, It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's living. It's alive. It's breathing. It's God-breathed. Uh, Put your ear next to it. You may hear it breathing. The idea is we look at this as something written 2,000 years ago, but it is God-breathed, and that's why this whole passage is saying today if you hear his voice, you believe the Spirit of God is using the Word of God even now to speak to your heart? And that you have a choice right now through the living Word of God to either harden your heart and say, that's not me, Or to soften it and say, God, yeah, expose the junk in this heart? Do we have that choice every time the Word of God is preached? That's why people don't like to hear the Word of God. That's why we do expository preaching. Uh, Pray for your pastor that I would be as accurate as I possibly can. But one protection I have is by going verse by verse through Scripture. So I can't skip the parts I don't like. Because believe me, there's some passages I would love to skip. <laughs> I don't understand them. They don't make a lot of sense as I went through the minor prophets. But expository preaching to me is the safeguard for the body of Christ, the safeguard for your pastor, because we have to let the Word of God confront us. It's not me over the Word of God picking what I like. It's the Word of God above me pointing out the things because I'm in this battle with you as well. It is living. It's active. Energase is the Greek word. It means it's alive. It's active. It's effective. It's got energy in it. Uh, I love how the Word of God compares itself to seed. I brought an apple seed here. Um, If I can get it out. If you were to see this seed, you wouldn't be too impressed with it. I mean, it looks sort of crude. It's not really that that great, not that impressive. But do you realize how much power is in this seed? More power than any scientist can figure out. Because if this seed finds a receptive soil, it has a life in it that can't be reproduced by science. That life that will shoot down roots and gain more and more water and then begin to grow, and over time, as it gets more and more nourishment, it produces fruit that has seeds within it to cause that fruit to spread to other trees. And that's in this little seed. And when the Word of God is called incorruptible seed, it's saying it is powerful, it's got energy. When it finds a receptive heart and you allow it to begin to renew your mind, over time it begins to change you from the inside out and you begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which you cannot produce in your own strength. It is living, it's powerful, it's got energy, it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing down uh, to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Marrow. It's a two-edged sword. Uh, it's a machaira is the Greek word. It's almost like a dagger that's very sharp. And it's meant to pierce me. <laughs> it's meant to go deep into my heart and expose my motives and to separate my soul and my spirit into the jo- joints and marrow. It's supposed to go deep into my heart and begin to confront the stuff I don't want to be confronted. When's the last time the Word of God bothered you? When's the last time it really bothered you? If it hasn't bothered you lately, you're probably either reading it superficially, well, not reading it, possibly, or reading it superficially, or reading it and applying it to other people in your life. Or when you get to parts you don't like, you skip it and you stick to the parts you really like. But the whole counsel of God is designed to expose my heart and to challenge me. And there's parts of the word God I don't like and that bother me. And I have a hard time with. And I don't want to run too quickly to grace. I love grace, and I think grace is all through it. But sometimes I need to allow the grace, the severe grace of God, to expose that. And then once it's exposed, then allow the grace of God to give me the strength I need to deal with it. Because it's meant to confront like a scalpel, go deep into my heart. And then fourthly, it is a discerner of the thoughts and the motives. It's a judge. It helps me understand my passions and my feelings. It helps me understand my motives and my thoughts. And that's why James compares it to a mirror. What's the purpose of a mirror? 
It just shows you what you look like. It's not meant to make you look worse than you are. It's not meant to make you look better than you are. It's meant to reflect who you are. How many of us looked in the mirror this morning? Why do we do that? It's scary, huh? <laughs> Why do we do that? Why do we wake up in the morning and immediately, generally, look in the mirror? You want to see what the night did to you, right? You want to see <laughs> what the darkness has done to you. And uh, you want to see, you, want the, you don't want the mirror to be a, one of those carnival mirrors. You just want a mirror to reflect back what has happened to you. And uh, your hair's all messed up now. You got uh, eye goop, you know, that you need to deal with. You're looking at yourself. You don't get mad at the mirror because it's reflecting who you are. You allow the mirror to do its reflection so that it then can point out the areas that need to be changed so that you can be presentable and put on Christ as you go out into the world. And so the idea is the Word of God is a discerner. It's meant to reflect back to me um, and to point out those areas that are still not shaped like Christ. And that's the point of what the mirror does. It's a searchlight. I like the fact he says, he goes on in verse 13, he says, and there's no creature hidden from his sight. So you're not doing any good pretending to be something you're not because God already sees who you really are. All things are naked or exposed and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Anybody have a different translation for that word open, naked or an open? Anybody have a different translation there? Exposed, laid bare. I like that term. Um, Open to the eyes. It's a unique word. It's trachalizo. Anybody want to guess what English word we get uh, from trach? Your trachea, yeah. Um, It's a wrestling term. It was a wrestler's term, a word used to describe for seizing an opponent by the throat in such a way that he could not move. He may escape God. We may escape God for long enough, but in the end, he grips us in such a way we cannot help meeting him face to face. God is one issue that no man can finally evade. God, through the Word of God, wants to put us in a chokehold. Um, when I was in Taekwondo, we did a lot of ground fighting, and um, I can remember in ground fighting, you do not want them to get access to your neck. You even go into turtle position if you have to, to try to avoid, because once they get your neck, you're in trouble, because when they put pressure on the front of your neck and they push on the back of your neck, eventually what do you have to do? called tapping out. (laughs) It's saying, yes, I surrender. You know how hard it is for an adult male to tap out to another adult male? Uh, When I did ground fighting and they would team you up with people about your own size and about your own age, and when someone would get me in a position where I knew I was done for, I would do everything I could to avoid tapping out because it's a humbling experience. But the Word of God is designed to confront us and put us into a place where finally we say, I surrender. I tap out. God, you are sovereign and I am not. Help me to trust you and allow you to do your deep surgery and work in my heart for your glory because that's where rest is found. And what I want to emphasize in all of this is God's purpose is redemptive talking about swords piercing deep into your heart. You're talking about a judge that discerns your thoughts and your motives and your feelings. You're talking about someone that puts a chokehold on you and you're thinking, that doesn't sound like it's got my best interests in mind. And God's saying, I am doing this. I'm crippling you. I'm putting you in this position. I'm laying you on your back. So finally, you'll understand what reality is. You're not sovereign and you're not in control. He is sovereign and he is in control And when I focus on the redemption that I have in his son and I hold fast to that confession and I trust him and allow his rest to penetrate my heart and begin to change me from the inside out, I experience the contentment and the fullness of God. But the thing that hinders that is disbelief and sin. And God wants to confront me there because he has redemptive purposes and he wants to shape me into the image of his son and I have to trust him. That's why the prayer for fullness, I think, is search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. His intents are good as he confronts us through his word. And his word confronts us all. (laughs) 
In fact, Romans 3, after doing this whole list of the fact that sin, is, all the things that are sin, and that none of us are righteous, no, not one, it says it confronts us with this so that the mouths of everyone in the world will be shut. Most of us have open mouths and closed hearts. And God says, I want to confront you to the place where you have an open heart and a closed mouth when it comes to me. Because then you're at the place where I can begin to shape you and change you into the image of my son. A few weeks ago, um, Amy Punke was cutting my hair. I asked, well, she does it for free. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> um, and she was cutting my hair, and as she was cutting my hair, she got to a part in the back of my head, and she said, have you had that for long? And I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, don't even, I can't see it. She said, you have a spot back here that you might want to get checked out. She said, I had something similar to that, and it looks very similar to what I had, so you may want to go to a dermatologist and check it out. At that moment, I had some choices. I mean, it, I can't see it. I even tried to look in a mirror, and I still couldn't see it. It's in a blind spot. It's hard for me to see. And I had to trust that Amy knew what she was talking about. She had my best interests in mind, and she said it's something that she has had before, so I could trust her. And that caused me to go to a doctor, and as I went to a the doctor, they take and they slice a bit of it out, and they test it. They compare it to healthy cells, I guess, and they look and see if it matches, and they found out that it was a basal cell carcinoma, basal cell. And then they said, we got to cut it out. And uh, so I go back a week later, and they put a bunch of shots in the top of my head, and she takes a scalpel, and she cuts out this cell. I can't see it. I don't know anything about it. But I trust uh, the diagnosis that it can be harmful to me if I don't do anything about it. And I trust the scalpel to cut it out and the doctor whose hand has skill to, to go and to do that and take it out of my head. Now, at the moment, when they sewed it back up, I felt like I was getting a facelift. I've never had my face... <laughs> pulled that tight in my life. I uh, thought they were putting my scalp into a ponytail. I was feeling weird. Um, and of course, my question in my vanity was, is this going to make my bald spot worse that I have back there? And uh, she actually said, no, it may help that some people used to have scalp reduction surgery where they'd cut out the bald spot and bring the hair there and <laughs> sort of got two for one there on that one. Um, but the point was, if you were to walk in or you didn't know what was going on and you saw someone with a knife cutting out top of someone's head, you would think that there's an evil purpose there. But if you understand that I had something that I couldn't see that had potential that if I didn't deal with it, it could create serious problems in my life. And I had to trust the exhortation of a friend and I had to trust the diagnosis of a doctor, and the sharpness of a scalpel to cut that out because it needed to be removed if I was going to enjoy health. That's the purpose of the Word of God. Believer, do not neglect the Word of God. If you're neglecting it, I can almost make an assumption as to why. You've either elevated something that is better and greater, or there's things you don't want the Word of God to confront. You want to know why this culture hates the Word of God? For this very reason. But it shuts all of our mouths up, and it points us to the only redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you this week. I put a little exercise in your bulletin. Um, one of the things we do with our half day of prayer is always have people start off with Psalm 139 and to search their heart. I would just challenge you, find some alone time this week and just ask God, pray that prayer in Psalm 139, search my heart, and then ask God to just begin to expose things. What am I angry about? What do I have shame about? What am I sad about? What am I afraid of? Uh, what, do I, what brings me joy? Just allow him to expose, give him that freedom to just do his work in your heart. And I would also challenge you because all of this is in the context of mutual exhortation to allow someone that you know and trust who knows you just to evaluate, go with an open heart and say, I just want to know areas in my life I may be missing, blind spots. Can you just help me um, and just evaluate my life? Find someone that you know is someone that will do that in a spirit of gentleness, but also one of spirit of honesty. My guess is most of us won't do this. 
we won't have time. It's not that important. Or I just don't want to be exposed. And that tells us everything we need to know about our hearts, doesn't it? Either something's better, or I don't want the Word of God to confront me, because I don't know if I can handle it. And I'm not talking about shame, shaming or guilt, because if you know Jesus Christ, that's been taken care of. I'm talking about allowing your heart to be shaped into the image of Christ so you can experience the fullness of relationship with God. Does that mean anything to you? If so, let us be diligent to enter that rest. Let's pray. Father, you are good and you love us and you know us better than we know ourselves. Father, I pray this body, I pray this pastor would be a body of believers that submits ourselves to you. Thank you for the cross. If someone here does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, they've not found rest in Christ, they're still working for their salvation, still basing it on something that uh, is not going to bring redemption. In fact, condemnation is what it brings. I pray they would run to your son, Jesus Christ, embrace him now as their Lord and Savior. Father, for those of us that know you, we can allow sin to creep into our hearts and bitterness to creep into our hearts. So many things that we're blind to and we self-justify. Father, open up our hearts to your scalpel and help us to allow you to take those things from our life and to expose those things and give us the strength and the courage to walk in obedience and rest with you. Father, thank you for this body. Protect this body through your word. And I pray these things in the name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.